let me say good morning, Doug Tallamy, and thank you for joining us today. Okay. Uh, it's an honor to introduce Doug Tallamy, professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, who will be talking about oaks, the most powerful plant of all. A man of many talents, Doug is not only an accomplished researcher, but also a best-selling author and an engaging and inspirational speaker. If you should have questions for Doug, type them into Zoom or YouTube, and we'll answer them during the Q&A session that will follow the talk. Since hearing Doug speak some years ago, I've thought differently about the way I managed my own garden. For one thing, it had not occurred to me that I would ever want to see caterpillars in my garden as much as I now do, but I yearn to see them. And after this talk, I'm sure that you will too. All right, Doug, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. And before I start, let me hats off to you. What a mammoth undertaking putting this together. Thank you. Ah. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, you are gonna talk about uh, the nature of oaks. So I'm really talking about the things that, that use oaks, a little bit more about that than, than about the oaks themselves. But uh, the story starts in the year 2000 when, when uh, my wife and I moved into uh, our house, our new house in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It was on a farm that had been broken up. The farm had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So there are very few plants there. Uh, and our, our goal, of course, was to restore the local ecosystem. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, of course, it's, it's East Coast centric because that's where I live. That's where I take most of my pictures. But I recognize most of the people uh, on the call here are from California, and I have westernized it as much as possible. But keep in mind, the interactions that I'm going to talk about um, occur pretty much all, all over the place, wherever oaks occur. Very similar interactions uh, happen. So we moved in in July. In uh, September of that year, about a mile and a half down the road, there were a couple of big white oaks that dropped some acorns. So we planted them uh, pretty much all over the property. White oaks germinate in the fall. They send down a, a root, a radical, uh, and that's pretty much all they do in the fall. And then they, in the spring, they'll put up their first leaves. And that's pretty much all they do in the spring and the summer as well. And this gives oaks the, the reputation of growing very slowly. Uh, they do grow slowly above ground in the beginning, but they're not actually growing slowly. Most of the growth is below ground. During that first year, oaks grow 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. So here's the little oak that we're going to spend a lot of time with today. It's covered by a deer cage. Um, it's not very big, but uh, this is the year two. Uh, but it has developed a root system that we'll see it through good times and bad times. This is what it looked like 18 years later. It's 45 feet tall. 47 inch circumference, canopy spread of 30 feet. I never watered it, I never fertilized it, there it is. Of course, it's still a baby, but it is a real landscape tree. Now, the point I wanna to make today is that oaks uh, are, are um, I call them uh, superior uh, um, biodiversity entities. They're supporting more life than uh, just about any other tree genus. Dozens of species of birds depend on oaks. A uh, number of mammals as well, uh, even, even bears, the big guys will spend the winter in the uh, large hollow sections of, of big oaks. Not that many reptiles depend on oaks, but there are several butterfly species that, that are specialists on them. And then hundreds of species of moths depend on oaks as well as their predators and parasitoids. Cynipid gall wasps, all those things making galls on oaks uh, have intimate relationships with that genus. Many beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils. And then we have a lot of, of uh, other types of arthropods, spiders and mollusks and annelids that depend on uh, the leaf litter and the very healthy soil that oaks create underneath that oak. So we have a very diverse web of life associated with oaks. The problem is it goes unnoticed by most people that, that uh, have oaks in their yards or drive by, and it's certainly then unappreciated. And that's why I wrote The Nature of Oaks. It is a month by month guide to the life that uh, is occurring on your oaks. And my goal was to provide the knowledge that then generates interest in oaks. And interest often leads to compassion. We are cutting down our oaks all over the place and we have to stop doing that. So I'm trying to get people to understand that these, these are living communities we need to protect. Before we start, a few facts. The genus Quercus contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. So for a deciduous tree genus, it's a large one. The word Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez meaning tree, and oaks are indeed fine trees. There are four major taxonomic sections within the genus in North America. 
uh, what we call the white oak group, the Quercus group, the red oak group, Lobati, the live oak group, Varentes, and a much smaller canyon oak group, Protobalanus. And those are the ones that occur, many of them occur in the West. This is the distribution of, of oaks uh, in, in uh, our country. Certainly most species, well, any place you have a color, including white, there's at least one species of oak. So there are no oaks where no, naturally occurring in the brown areas. But the deep green areas have the most species. Um, center of distribution is certainly in the Southeast, but uh, California has 20 species of oaks. So you're not, you're not doing uh, too badly. Mexico, there are at least 250 species of oaks in Mexico. So that's really where the center of distribution is. Now oaks grow, uh, a long time. They have a very long life cycle, 900 year average life cycle, which is much longer than, than most people realize. 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods, they're delivering unique uh, ecological contributions to the landscape around them. If your oak doesn't live that long, it's because of something we've been doing to it, typically messing up the root system with roads or cellars or pipelines. Uh, or depriving it of nutrients by raking leaves away for centuries and so on. Everybody wants to know what the oldest oak in the country is. Uh, certainly one of the contenders would be the Pinchinka oak and uh, it's on an Indian reservation in, in uh, California, Temecula, California. Said to be 2000 years old, uh, that's a contender. We've got some 1500 year oaks on the, the uh, East Coast. But the true winners would be the Palmer oak which is a small, it's almost a, like a ground cover. Um, it, it roots itself along the ground and then spreads, the section over here will die and it'll, it'll uh, continue living over here. This specimen has been dated at 13,000 years old. So one of the oldest living specimens of anything on the planet. Uh, and it's found in California. This is the Y oak uh, in Y, Maryland. Uh, it was the largest white oak uh, in the country. It fell over in a hurricane about 15 years ago, but I got to see it before it did. Uh, and again, it gives the impression that all oaks are gigantic, but think of that Palmer oak, all oaks are not gigantic. And there's several small ones that we can use even in small spaces. So another, another uh, point I'm gonna hammer home today is that oaks have superior ecological function. They do have the highest biodiversity value because they are supporting more forms of life. They're wonderful at sequestering carbon dioxide, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, and then building their tissues out of it, which they can hold for a long time, but they also pump carbon into the soil through their root systems. Uh, and that's probably the most valuable form of carbon sequestration that plants are doing for us. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have left there over the eons. And once it's in the soil, until the soil is disturbed again, it stays there. You can measure that in thousands of years. Oaks are some of the best soil stabilizers we have when you have uh, those very large root systems. They make the best leaf litter, meaning it lasts the longest. Uh, and, and we'll talk about why that's important. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. I started the book in October. And everybody wants to know why I started in October, because that was when my wife, Cindy, said, you should write a book about oaks. So, okay, October, I looked out the window, that's what the oak looked like that we're gonna follow. Uh, and of course in October, this is when people start to notice those, those acorns. They've been on the tree for several months, but people don't notice them until they start to fall from the tree. And when they fall from the tree, there can be a lot of them. A single oak can produce up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And each one of those is a little, uh, very important nugget of food for some animal. It's very high in protein, very high in fat, and many things depend on it. There are a number of rodents that depend on, on acorns. Uh, and again, the big guys do as well. They'll lap up as many acorns as they can in the fall. And that's, that provides the fat that helps them get through long winters. Squirrels, of course, like acorns and those, those cute deer that we all love, but many birds as well, turkeys. Now you don't have turkeys naturally in California, but got introduced turkeys and they walk around eating those, those uh, acorns all fall long. So do red belly woodpeckers and tip mice and towhees and uh, nut hatches and flickers, a number of birds. Many ducks as well. Wood ducks really love acorns. Any acorn that falls into the water, the wood duck dives down and, and uh, grabs it. And they'll get up on the shore and, and just gobble them down. There are also a number of invertebrates that depend on acorns, like the acorn weevil. Here's an acorn weevil larva tunneling out of an acorn, and that's what the adult looks like. 
and a uh, another group of insects that uses acorn. This is the acorn moth, and it's doing pretty much the same thing as the acorn weevil. The larva, the caterpillar develops within the acorn, and it tunnels out and then becomes a moth. This is a species complex. There's several species that do this, but they all look so similar. Uh, it's very tough to tell which one you have. So with all these things eating acorns, if you look under an oak tree just a few weeks after they drop their acorns, there's just about nothing left. Uh, they're all eaten or squished or carried away, and you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. And this is where a very ancient mutualism between jays, the jay lineage all over the world actually, and oaks comes into play. Both jays and oaks evolved in the same place at the same time about 65 million years ago in Southeast Asia. Uh, and they developed uh, a, a dependence on each other. Jays, of course, get food from oaks in the form of those acorns. What do jays do for oaks? Well, uh, they allow oaks to move farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. And this is how that happens. Jays store acorns for winter food. They don't cache them. They're burying them individually. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll pick up an acorn and then they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree before they bury that acorn. And that's, that's key. They're moving those acorns a long way from the parent tree. And they'll look for an area that's of disturbed soil. They'll tap the acorn beneath the, the soil surface uh, and then the object is to go back and get it during the winter time. Now, if they thought uh, or think that another jay has watched them bury their acorn, uh, they'll wait a few minutes, then they'll dig up their acorn and, and they'll move it because jays know that jays steal acorns. Then during the winter, they're gonna go back, have something to eat. During a single fall, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns. So they're moving a lot of acorns around, but they only remember where one out of every four of those acorns uh, are. So that means a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees each year. And if they do that a mile from the tree, that is how oaks are, are moving farther and faster, dispersing. Uh, and you would say, what do you mean dispersing? Well, you know, when the glaciers came down, they pushed many of our, our plants all the way down to the Gulf Coast or into Mexico. And then when they receded, those plants moved back up into the north. Oaks led the way because Joe, jays were moving those acorns so far. It's not just blue jays that are doing this. We have seven or eight species of jays around the country. Uh, in the West, of course, you have uh, a couple of species of scrub jays. This is one from uh, Oregon uh, doing the same thing with, uh, with acorns. Uh, then you also have the acorn woodpecker, another bird that specialized on acorns, a very beautiful bird in the Southwest. It doesn't bury acorns in the uh, soil for the winter time. What it does is find a dead tree, a snag, and it drills holes in the tree and then sticks the acorn in, in the holes. And that's how the acorn spends the winter. And then of course they, they uh, eat the acorn whenever they get hungry. So an acorn tree can be a really valuable resource for acorn woodpecker families. They work together as family groups. They protect their tree, make sure no other acorn woodpeckers come and take them because they have spent a lot of time making that tree. There are up to 50,000 holes drilled into an acorn tree. So if you have an acorn tree in your yard, uh, it's enormously entertaining. Interesting thing, a fact about uh, the Pacific populations of the acorn woodpecker, they have a bill that's 20% longer than interior populations. Why? Because you've got some really long acorns uh, in, in the, uh, uh, along the coast there. So they need deeper holes in order to bury those acorns into the, the snag. Okay, November. This is when you might notice another feature of oaks that is, is very unusual, and that is uh, it's a deciduous tree, but, but oaks, particularly in the white oak group, tend not to drop their leaves. They hang on to their leaves. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one month ahead of myself. You will notice that uh, you either had a lot of acorns uh, or this year, or you had very few acorns. And when you have a lot of acorns, uh, that is called a mast year. And what's interesting is there's very few, there's not much uh, in between. Oaks are, are masting or they're making very few acorns at all. So again, unusual behavior. And ecologists always wanna describe unusual behavior. There are four hypotheses uh, that uh, have been offered to explain oak masting, and they are not mutually exclusive. They all could be working together to select for this curious reproductive behavior. Predator satiation, predator reduction, 
improve pollination and energy partitioning. Let's look at each one of those. Predator satiation, this is an acorn weevil. It's outside the acorn, but that's what it looks like. They can be really numerous. Uh, you can have uh, acorn weevils in 90% of the acorns that are produced by a tree. Uh, and this is true for acorn moths and all the other things that eat acorns. If oaks made the same number of acorns every single year, the population of things that depend on acorns would stabilize around that number. Uh, and they would eat all the acorns. It'd be very hard for uh, an acorn to escape predation. But if oaks are variable in how they make their acorns, they could make a whole bunch one year and the acorn weevil populations would build up, the squirrel populations would build up. And then the next year they make almost no acorns, then those populations would crash. That's called predator reduction. Uh, you do have active starvation out there in nature. And typically oaks will go three, four, five years before they have another mast. Uh, so the, the uh, populations of things that depend on acorns would remain low. And then you have a big mast and there's far more acorns produced than creatures that could eat them. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated. Uh, these are the male catkins that, that hang down in the spring. And if uh, oaks are coordinated in when they're, they're reproducing, uh, it increases the probability that pollen will reach the female flowers if everybody's releasing their pollen at the same time. And then finally, energy allocation. And by the way, if you wonder whether oaks can have good fall color, they can. This is a scarlet oak. It's one of the best. All right, energy allocation. There's rarely enough energy to go around. So oaks partition it. They either put it towards growth or they put it towards reproduction, making acorns. But rarely do they do both at the same time. I mean, they'll grow a little bit each year. But if they're going to have a mast year, they don't grow much at all. So those are the four hypotheses. They all could be happening at the same time to explain oak masting. All right, now we're going to talk about the, the uh, fact that uh, oaks, particularly in the white oak group, hold on to their leaves during the winter time. That's a condition called marcescence. Uh, and for a deciduous tree, it's really unusual. What are they doing that for? Well, uh, again, hypotheses. This is the leading one. And uh, this is a picture of the large mammals that occurred in Mexico alone. There were three species of mammoths. There was the uh, giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet. There were camels and horses. Uh, the world had 44 species of, of rhinoceros back then. So lots of things. Uh, and most of them were plant eaters. And many of them were browsers, just like our, our deer are today. A browser is something that's eating woody material, particularly buds, all winter long. It's not, not eating uh, you know, grass on the ground. So if oaks protect their buds by surrounding them with the dead leaves of the previous year, it makes for a very untasty mouthful. Very difficult to get at that bud without getting a mouthful of dead dry leaves. It's also difficult to eat an oak uh, without making a lot of leaf rustling sound. And there were big predators back then too that tracked those big herbivores. Uh, so the distribution of marcescent leaves supports that hypothesis because they're typically only uh, on the lower branches. If you get up above 18 feet, above where that, that uh, giant sloth could reach, no more marcescent leaves. Very difficult to test this hypothesis and prove it, but it makes a nice story. It also gives oaks a uh, wonderful landscape attribute. If you don't like your neighbor, you can use your oak as a screen. You can screen him out even in the winter time because the oaks will hang on to their leaves. Okay, January. Um, you know, where I come from, January's cold. People don't spend a lot of time uh, outside looking at their oaks, but uh, it, things go dormant in most parts of, of North America. Um, so most people are not out looking up in their, their oak trees in January. But if you do, you're likely to see little birds flitting, flitting around up there. And we don't think much about that. Uh, but remember, birds have very, very tight energy budgets. They're not doing anything for the fun of it or very little for the fun of it, uh, because they'll use up energy. So what are these birds? What are things like the black cap chickadee and bush tits uh, up there in those oak trees doing? And also the golden crown kinglet. I took this picture of golden crown, golden crown kinglet in my yard when it was snowing. Um, I think it was, it was January. This is particularly uh, confusing. I mean, the chickadee uh, eats seeds, 50% of its diet in the wintertime is seeds. It's the same with, with titmice. Uh, but the, the bush tits and the, the uh, kinglets are insectivores. They're not eating seeds. 
uh, and they should have migrated. What are they spending the winter time uh, up north for when there are no insects to eat? Well, Bern Heinrich uh, doesn't like, uh, we call it the kinglet paradox, the fact that it's up here when it should have migrated. He doesn't like paradoxes. So what he did was look in the crops of kinglets in January uh, in Maine, and he found they were full of caterpillars in January in Maine. And by the way, there are golden crown kinglets in California as well. Uh, and if you look carefully at your oak branches, you will find caterpillars sitting up there. They're just sitting there looking like sticks, and some of them look a lot like sticks. They are mostly in the family geometridae, the inchworms, but they're spending the winter in your oak trees just sitting there. When it gets cold, if it goes below freezing, they're antifreeze proteins in the cells that keep those cells from bursting. Uh, so the, the insect shrinks a little bit, and then when it gets warmer, it swells a little bit. But there's nothing to eat for the caterpillar. It's just sitting there. So there's no more kinglet paradox. We know what they're doing. They're up there eating caterpillars all winter long. The next question is, what are the caterpillars doing up there? Um, it seems like a very strange behavior. Most insects overwinter as eggs that doesn't take any, any nutrients, or they winter, overwinter as chrysalids or pupae, and then emerge in the spring. And a few overwinter as adults, but very few overwinter as mature larvae like this. And the only thing we can, we can imagine is that uh, these guys will have a competitive edge over anything that was an egg. Those guys have to hatch out. Remember in the spring, the, the uh, leaves are going to emerge. A, an egg will hatch out into a very tiny caterpillar. It's not gonna be competitive with a very big caterpillar. Something overwintered as an adult will have to find a mate, then lay eggs, and then those eggs will hatch. So they're even farther behind. Um, so the, as best we can tell, it simply puts those caterpillars that make it through the winter at a competitive advantage. They have an endless food supply when all of those buds actually burst in the spring. Okay, February, this is uh, the quietest time of year in most parts of the country for oaks. So it's a good time to talk about what I call oak landscaping myths. Now, it wasn't that long ago where myths actually had some uh, degree of fact associated with them. And then the myth, uh, uh, built was built around it. Not so much today, but um, let's look at whether there are any facts supporting uh, whether oaks are too expensive to buy. I hear that all the time. I can't afford an oak. They're going to grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. They get too big on small lots. If we do use them, they're going to fall over and crush our house. Um, they're going to lift up our hardscape, our sidewalks, and our driveways. Fact or fiction? Well, are oaks too expensive? Um, they can be if you insist on planting a large oak. Uh, this is a picture by Bob Sorensen of, of uh, one of your Western oaks, very beautiful. But nurserymen are, are on to the fact that we want instant gratification. We want to plant big trees. We want to build a landscape that is finished on day one. Uh, and of course, that's, you know, landscapes are dynamic. They tend to, to grow in. So people like to buy very large trees. You can pay up to $3,000 for a large oak. But look, it's a large tree in a very small pot, which means the, the root system that supports this large tree has been artificially um, decreased. It's too small to, to support a plant like this. Uh, and of course, if you, if you don't have a special air pot, uh, you end up with a, uh, with, this is called um, root binding, um, and that's deadly to the tree. Those roots will continue to grow and then strangle the tree and it's not gonna live very long. Uh, but uh, this is, these are air pots and we can grow plants now without being root bound, but the, the root system is still small. And when we plant those trees, uh, they will spend a long time rebuilding their, their root system. It's hard on the trees. I passed this planting of, I think it was 15 oaks in uh, Newark, Delaware, a couple of years ago, all of them died. So they spent a lot of money because they insisted on, on using large trees. The other option is bald and burlap, where you, you simply cut off all the roots, wrap it up in, in burlap, and then sell that. Again, hard on the trees. And once you put it in the ground, if it lives, it's going to spend up to a decade or even longer rebuilding the root system so that it's big enough to support active growth in this tree. If I plant an acorn the same day I plant one of these trees, acorn's free, this could cost a lot of money. The acorn's going to germinate put down a big root system. And by the end of that decade, when this thing is, is uh, still rebuilding its roots, it will be bigger and taller and much healthier than any of those large trees that you buy. This is a great, a great size to plant your oak. 
<clears throat> it's hard to find them this size because again, you can't charge very much money for this, but you can also create your own oak trees, just find acorns and germinate them. It's easier if you start them in a pot instead of putting them right in the ground because uh, there's a lot of rodents and things that will eat them in the ground. And then you put them out when they're this size. But that leads to the next question, and that is, do oaks really grow too slowly to use as landscape plants? I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And of course, if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But is it going to grow too slowly for you to, for you to enjoy? Let's have a race between uh, my white oak here, this is the one we're following, and my little friend Bella, who's two years old here. She loved this oak. Um, she's, she's not my daughter. She's not our granddaughter. She was our surrogate granddaughter for, uh, for years. Uh, she was born on my wife's birthday and we ended up watching her uh, four or five days a week. So Bella, uh, she's tall for her age. Uh, and this tree is six years old here. So let's see which one's going to grow faster. Remember, this is a white oak. It's got a reputation for growing very slowly. Maybe Bella can catch it. Here it is, seven years old, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, Bella is clearly losing, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's Bella with her mask on, 2020. She has not uh, won the race. This, this white oak has clearly beaten her. We're not going to do this anymore because Bella's 5'11 already. She's not growing anymore, but the tree is, is still growing. So, you know, after that, those slow uh, first couple of years, oaks take off and, <clears throat> and grow pretty much as fast as, as a lot of other trees. And they start to contribute to the, the ecosystem, particularly the food web in your yard immediately. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. <clears throat> and I'm showing this to you to show you how much and how early oaks contribute to food webs by passing on the energy they've captured from the sun. I'm not trying to convince you that caterpillars are going to kill all your oaks. This tree is just fine um, and it's almost through eating. So they're, they're very resilient after they share their leaf material. Are oaks too large to use in small yards? Well, you're not going to find a, a landscape designer or a landscape architect anywhere that will suggest a large oak for a small yard. But I see it as I'm driving, driving around. These are two big red oaks that are in very small yards as I move drive into the university. I'm sure they were planted at the same time uh, this house was built, which is probably 100 years ago. And remember, 100 years ago, there was no... Uh, no air conditioning. So they provided a very important ecosystem services by, by dropping the temperature of this house by 10 degrees in the summertime. But again, you're not, and, but look, they're also not lifting up the hardscape here. You're not gonna get anybody to recommend that. Point is there are small oaks. So if we have small yards, you can put in a small oak. Um, and in the West, you've got a lot more options to do that. The yellow species, the highlighted species here are just the number of small oaks in Texas alone. Um, so you've got a number of them, including that, that palmer oak that I mentioned earlier, uh, but others are shrub-like, others are small trees. The one that we plant in the east the, the uh, most would be the dwarf chestnut oak. The Georgia oak is actually an endangered species, but it's occasionally in the, uh, in the trade. There's a dwarf live oak, um, Quercus virginiana minima. So there are small options. We need to get more of them into the, the trade, which will be easy. Oaks are easy to grow once the nurserymen realize that there is a demand for them. This is a picture of my uh, dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides. It makes acorns when it's five feet tall. Uh, this is another option I'd, I'd like to see people try. It's called coppicing. Uh, I don't know how much you coppice in the West, but in the East, uh, people used to coppice all the time to make uh, uh, building materials for a lot of things, baskets and many other things. The, the colonists did this quite a bit. What you do is you let your oak grow till a diameter of three or four inches, then cut it off at the base and it will come back as a shrub. And you can cut it off for a century. So you can have a shrub oak in your yard simply by coppicing. Our oak's gonna crush your house. Uh, they could, uh, but, and it's not just oaks, any large tree can fall over and crush our houses or crush our cars. And when they do, we hear about it on the news. The news will only port, report bad things. Um, they certainly don't report every time the oak doesn't fall over and, and crush your house. The reason these things are falling over is because of the way we insist on planting them. We want everything to be a specimen tree. So we make sure it's uh, not close to any other tree. 
So that's not competing for light or water or nutrients, but that means its root system is not interlocking with another tree. So you get a, a windy, rainy uh, period and boom, over they go. But this is the way trees grow in a forest. They typically grow close enough together so that their roots are interlocked. Uh, and it's an extremely strong matrix. This is a, a stream cut near uh, our house that has what, one, ooh, come back here. One, two, three, four trees. All of the roots are really interlocked. And that's the way plants grow in the wild. Very stable, no straight line wind is gonna blow them over. Uh, a tornado could snap them off, but there's no landscaping trick that's gonna protect you from, from tornadoes. So instead of this, consider this. These are the white oaks that we got our uh, acorns from originally. They're uh, down the street from us. Uh, they were here before they put this road in. That's three foot distance between them. Neither one is as big and majestic as it would be if it had been isolated, but they're both still standing. And we need to start training our eyes to view trees in groves so that they can be stabilized in our human dominated landscapes. Here are three big red oaks in, in uh, Northwest Connecticut growing naturally right next to each other. And this is a planned landscape at one of the DuPont estates, uh, Mount Cuba. This is a big red oak in the back here. Uh, these are hemlocks in the front, big rhododendrons down here and some hardscape. It looks totally natural, but it was planned. All of these big trees have interlocked their roots. Uh, so folks with large uh, amounts of, of lawn and they wanna reduce that, wondering how to do it, you can put in a little forest, a little tree grove that provides lots of habitat. It's beautiful, um, looks natural, uh, and it will be very stable. Will oaks lift up your hardscape? Uh, well, it depends on what you plant them over. If you plant them over bedrock, yes, they will. Their roots have to go laterally. If you plant them over agricultural pan that has been, uh, that's where the plow goes down for about 15 inches and really compacts the soil beneath the plow, and you do that for a century, it gets really hard down there. Then the oaks will grow along the, the pan. You can actually break up uh, agricultural pan though with, with a, a ripper on the back of a tractor. But if you have nice deep soil, the oak is not gonna lift up anything. This is a pin oak. Uh, its roots have easily gone beneath the, the street here. Here are two big red oaks at the University of Delaware. Big trees right next to a curb. No problem with, with lift at all. So uh, it's a possibility that it'll lift up your hardscape, but certainly not a, a certainty. All right, March, this is when the oak leaves are finally starting to fall. Uh, so let's talk about what oak leaf litter does. But first let's talk about the variability in oak leaves. There's a tremendous amount of variability in oak leaves. A lot of people think if it doesn't have lobes, it's not an oak. Uh, well, that's a live oak. This is a willow oak. This is an emery oak from Arizona. Looks like a holly. That's a water oak. There are a lot of oaks that do not have uh, lobes on their leaves. A lot of them do. Juvenile leaves are bigger than adult leaves, um, but tremendous amount of variation out there. And oaks make a lot of leaves. A large oak will make up to 700,000 leaves. If you lay those leaves uh, out next to each other on a tennis court, it would cover four tennis courts. And that's their primary job. Uh, leaf litter is covering the ground. It's keeping the moisture in the ground. The soil, our soil community is, is, is Really, it's essential to healthy plant growth. That's where all the mycorrhizae uh, uh, fungi live. Um, that's where the detritivores are that are recycling these leaves, returning nutrients to the soil so that the plants can take them up again. All of these soil organisms require high humidity, require the moisture to be retained, and that's what leaf litter does. Not only does it return the nutrients to the soil, but it, it keeps the moisture there so that the things that, that uh, operate our soil ecosystems can continue to exist. And oak leaves uh, take up to three years before they break down. So they're covering the soil uh, longer and better than, than uh, just about any other tree. Now I know in the West, this, this causes a problem because you are told to get rid of all your leaf litter for fire control hazards. And, and I, don't, I don't know what to say about that. Um, it, it, you know, I guess that's good to control the fires, but it's really hard on the soils. You get that sun bake condition and you're really hammering your, your soil ecosystem. People one worry whether their plants can get through a, a normal layer of, of oak leaf litter. Yes, they can. This is a, just a natural, it's not a planting of, of ferns. They're just naturally there coming through. Nobody's, nobody's monitoring them. Uh, and they're protecting an awful, awful lot of, of life forms. There are more species that live underground than above the ground. 
in a square meter of, of soil beneath oak leaf litter, you can have 250,000 mites. You can have 100,000 springtails, columbulins, like this little sminthurid guy here. 90,000 proturans, those are primitive insects that uh, you practically need a microscope to see. A million nematodes, all of these guys are under there. They're all turning over that leaf litter, returning soil nutrients to the soil. So imagine what happens when we rake our leaves away. We're removing the soil, we're destroying the soil ecosystem, not removing the nutrients, uh, preventing the recycling of, of nutrients. It's very hard on the tree and very hard on the things that live in the soil. There are a number of butterflies that specialize on oak leaf litter after it's fallen, when it's on the ground, like the banded hair streak. Um, it's a beautiful, very beautiful butterfly and it's, it's pretty common too. But this is what the, the caterpillars eat. You wouldn't think anything would want that, but, but they do eat it. And there are 70 species of what we call litter moths. Uh, moths that where the caterpillars eat dead leaves. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus and 67 other species. When you see your towhees and, and uh, uh, white throated sparrows and white crowned sparrows jumping on the ground and pushing leaf litter back with their feet, they're trying to expose these moths and their caterpillars to, to have something to eat. So again, when we rake all that leaf litter away, we're throwing away a valuable food source. And of course, then you have all the predators that depend on these things as well. A number of ground beetles, you have centipedes, you have millipedes, um, very active predator community, and you have lightning bugs all over the country. People saying, where are the lightning bugs gone? Of course, they're not bugs at all, they're beetles. Um, California has 18 species of fireflies, by the way, uh, lightning bugs, fireflies, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, and a lot of Californians think you have none. Well, you gotta make the right habitat for them. This is an adult, that's the lantern that lights up to attract uh, the opposite sex. But this is the larva. It looks like a little dinosaur. Where does it live? In leaf litter. It is a predator in leaf litter that feeds on other arthropods, it feeds on, on uh, worms, on annelids, and on snails. And when we rake all that away, we lose our lightning bugs. Okay, April. This is when those buds finally do uh, uh, burst forth, at least at, at, uh, at our house. And it's also the chance to look at one of the, or observe one of the most ephemeral interactions in all of nature. It takes about five minutes a year. You have to be in the right place at the right time, but it's actually very common. And I'm talking about when sinipid gall wasps lay their eggs in oak buds. They're starting their galls. So that's what you're looking at here. This is a female sinipid wasp of a particular species. That's her ovipositor right there, and she's injecting an egg into the bud of the oak. This is a male sinipid. Uh, he's already mated with her once, uh, and that's the, uh, the sperm she will use to fertilize this egg, but she's going to lay another egg after she lays this one, and he wants to be around to make sure he's the father. And this is a male who wishes he was this male. So she is laying an egg, but also injecting plant hormones into the, the bud when she's doing it. Remember, the cells in a bud are meristematic cells. They're essentially stem cells. They can go in any direction. And the, the sinipid gall wasp wants them to go in a particular direction that will make a species-specific house for them. We call it a gall. Uh, people say it's like a cancerous growth. It's just the opposite. Cancerous growths are uncontrolled gro uh, growth. They just grow and grow and grow. Galls are highly controlled uh, growth. And not only is it controlled by the sinipid galler, it's controlled by the oak itself. It's a compromise between what the oak wants and what the galler wants. And it creates a species specific swelling and that's where the gall larva is contained. This is another species of galler. It's laying an egg in one of my, my oak buds last spring. I tagged that uh, little stem so I could follow it. And that's the gall that resulted from that overposition. There are a lot of species of, of gallers out there worldwide, 5,000 species of, of sinipid gallers that are associated with oaks. California has 90 species. You've got a very large uh, galler uh, um, community. A single oak tree can support 70 species of gallers. It's very hard to find. It may be impossible to find an oak that does not have a galler associated with it. And many of these galls are hollow. This is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. You can see it written both ways. And if you cut it open, the gall is in a little spherical disc in the center here, and then there's a lot of air. And then there's the outside of the gall. What is all this wasted space for? Well, it turns out that, that sinipid gallers have more natural enemies, more parasitoids, more members of other uh, families of Hymenoptera. This is a pterimid uh, parasitoid. 
that want to lay their eggs in the cynipid larvae. Uh, and this is what they do it with, a, a very long sword-like ovipositor. So what the gall has to do is keep this ovipositor away from the larva. So the distance, the air-like distance between the galler and the outside of the gall has to be longer than this ovipositor. Otherwise, the, the pteromid can reach it. Now, there is a period of growth when the gall is very small where the pteromid can reach it, and that's when the galler is at risk, but it grows very quickly and puts the galler uh, out of reach of these natural enemies. This is Pterimus californicus. It has the longest ovipositor of any pterimid, and that has resulted in the largest gall in North America on uh, Quercus gariana, the Oregon oak, or the Oregon white oak. Um, because the distance between the galler and the outside of the gall has to be longer than that of a positor. A lot of, lot of uh, variation in, in uh, gall shape and size and color. Uh, and some of them are quite pretty. Some of them look like plant diseases. Some of them grow on the leaf itself. Some of them grow on the stems. Some of them look like candy. And I'll tell you, the, the galls in particularly Northern California are the prettiest galls in the country. This is, this is from Northern California. Some look like that. Some do look like uh, plant diseases. Spindle gall, uh, there's a man named Tim Boomer who loves taking pictures of gallers. They're on his Flickr site. Um, some look like candy. These again are from the West, very cool looking. This is a pottery type shaped gall in, in my yard. This is my favorite. I call it the little gnome house gall. It's actually called the, the mushroom gall wasp that makes it, but it's very, very cute a brain gall in my yard. Here's a, uh, this is a single leaf that produced four galls, but there were multiple adults coming out of each gall. So this single leaf produced, you can count them up. I don't know how many hundreds of, of gallers uh, were produced by that single leaf. And galls have played an interesting history in uh, the, the recorded history or interesting role in the recorded history of, of we humans. If you grind up a gall like this, and that's the exit hall. That's where the galler comes out. You grind it up and you, you uh, combine it with particular chemicals. It makes an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that our recorded history has been recorded with. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with, with gall ink. So all the writings of the monks and the scribes in the Middle Ages used gall ink. So without galls, who knows? Maybe we never would have even learned to read. Okay, May is when the, the uh, biological new year of, of uh, oaks really bursts forward or forth, uh, at least in the East Coast here. That's when those leaves fully expand. And uh, so this is happening all over the temperate zone, of course, but following the leaf expansion comes the caterpillars that eat those, those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves come the birds that eat those caterpillars. I'm talking about our neotropical migrants. We have 386 species of birds that are neotropical migrants. And it is no coincidence they are flying north to reproduce when all those caterpillars are around. Remember, plants don't make seeds and berries in the spring. They make them after a period of growth. So these birds are depending on insects and it's primarily the caterpillars when they're migrating. Uh, and birders know all over the country that if you want to see warblers, you go to oaks because that's where those warblers will be. And they will be there because that's where most of the food is. Uh, I had a student, Christy Beal, uh, measure the amount of time warblers spent foraging in various tree families. She did it in large cemeteries. This first family here is the Fagaceae. That's the one that con uh, contains the oaks. Oaks, beeches, and, and chestnuts. Well, in her samples, uh, there were no beeches and chestnuts. So this is entirely oaks here compared to pines, compared to birches, and so on. The birds are going where the food is. And by the food, I'm talking about those caterpillars, things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth the red line panapoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, and they're called slugs because the head is, is tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. 
the streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser rogue dagger moth, the greater rogue dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and the spun glass slug caterpillar, which to me is the prettiest caterpillar in the country. It does look like spun glass. And literally hundreds more species are found on oaks. Now, in the, through the years, this is what our house looks like uh, now, well, when the leaves come out, um, because we put a lot of plants back. And our research has shown that, that uh, caterpillars are enormously important in terms of developing food webs. So five years ago, I decided to try to count all of the moth species that are now making a home at our, our house. And I'm up to 1,140 species of just moths so far. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Point I wanna make is, not only is that a lot of species, but 30% of them are using the oaks that we have put in our yard. And because we've got so many uh, types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not just flew by, but bred. That's the role of native plants and oaks are playing that role better than any others. That's why I call them keystone species. Remember what a keystone is? This is a Roman arch, and that is the, the uh, stone in the middle of the arch. That's what a keystone is. And if you take the keystone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of our local food web, the food web collapses because they're making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives food webs. which means you've got a lot of native plants not making all that much caterpillar food. Oaks are supporting more species of caterpillars nationwide than any other plant by far, 950 species of caterpillars nationwide. Why do we need so many caterpillars? Well, caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we don't have a lot of caterpillars in our landscapes, we have a failed food web and eventually a failed ecosystem. Um, and the birds, of course, we like birds, so let's just focus on them. It takes thousands of caterpillars to get uh, one clutch of even tiny birds through to maturity. This is the Carolina chickadee. It weighs a third, what, three ounces. That's, that's um, four pennies. Is it three ounces or a third of an ounce? I'm, I'm going crazy here. Not much, it's a tiny bird. And it takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make to get one batch of these babies to the point where they leave the nest. And that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. After they leave the nest, the parent continue to bring them caterpillar for, for another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one family of birds through to independence. And of course, we want diverse bird communities in our yard. So we need to put the plants that make all those caterpillars in our yards, or we won't have these birds. June. Uh, this past year in June uh, was periodical cicada month for, for us. We had an emergence of the 17-year cicada. There's also a 13-year brood uh, in other parts of the country. Um, California has 65 species of cicadas, but you don't have any periodical cicadas. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. So you didn't get to en enjoy the fun. We had a lot of, of uh, cicadas. I, last summer, I was 70 years old, and these only come out once every 17 years, so I'm not going to see them till I'm 87. I wanted to take advantage of it this time, uh, so it was a, a lot of fun. Um, the point I want to make, though, before I leave cicadas is that uh, they do prefer oaks when they're, when they're laying their eggs. I had a student look at uh, where most of the oviposition occurred in Newark, Delaware. They lay on a lot of trees, but the green bars are species of oaks, and they definitely preferred them. You might wonder why they are periodical. Why do they stay underground for 17 years? Many other cicada species don't. And the answer probably has something to do with predator satiation again. Um, a lot of things eat cicadas. All those mammals eat them, uh, many birds eat them, but you can't specialize on something that only comes out once every 17 years. So the populations of the things that eat cicadas are never large enough to, to uh, eat all of them. And that's why they come out synchronously in big numbers. Okay, July. July is when the night chorus begins. And by night chorus, I'm talking about cicadas. I mean, I'm talking about the katydids. This is a male katydid. And what it does is uh, raise its four wings and move them back and forth across each other. There's a scraper and a file there, and it makes a species specific song. Why are they making that song? Well, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. 
Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. There are four species of katydids that frequent oak forests uh, in the east. You only have one uh, that is in the same format. I mean, you've got a lot of species of katydids, but only one that's going to sing like this. And that's the Anglewind katydid in, in California. This is what a female looks like before she's matured. Her wings haven't expanded yet, but here's her ovipositor. It looks like a spatula. Uh, and um, that's what the wings look like when they are fully, fully expanded. Why are they singing and why are they singing so loudly? Why is it the male singing? Well, the male is advertising his quality and the female is judging the male based on how loudly he sings. Only a healthy male can sing very, very loud, a large healthy male. So she's gonna go to the loudest male. When she lays her eggs, she uh, just glues them to the side of a stick. They're, they're quite large and sometimes people find these and wonder what they are. These guys have already hatched. Um, but most of the time, the eggs are laid up in the canopy of trees, particularly those oaks, and, and we don't see them. So Katie did sing uh, starting in July, um, at, at least in the east here. They sing right through August into September um, until, uh, well, at least in our area, until the first frost uh, knocks them off. I did a lot of, of camping in North Jersey when I was a, a boy, and Katie did sang me to sleep many nights. It's one of my favorite nature sounds. Well, speaking of August, uh, that is when oak leaves are really tough to eat. Uh, and it's one of the defenses of oaks. There, you know, a lot of things depend on oaks, but the oaks do try to, to uh, prevent uh, things from eating them. So they load their leaves with tannins and, and lignans, make them very tough over the course of the season. There is a defense or, or a counter uh, adaptation to that, that toughness that many caterpillars have come up with, and that is gregarious feeding. They're all gonna feed together. Many mouths can get through that tough material when they, when they work at it together. This is the yellow neck caterpillar uh, feeding gregariously. This is what it looks like when it's a small uh, instar. This is what it looks like when it's almost fully grown. They still are working together. Uh, the uh, orange humped oakworm, the pink striped oakworm, gregarious feeding in, in August caterpillar feeders uh, is very common. Uh, this is this is our oak that we're, we're looking at. I walked around the base of this tree in, in uh, 2014 and counted the caterpillars just on the, the lower branches. I didn't get in a ladder or anything. Uh, and I got 410 caterpillars uh, just on those lower branches. 115 of them were yellow net caterpillars that eat a lot of material. And then I stood back and took this picture. So I can ask you, do you see any of those caterpillars? Don't tell me you do, because I know you don't. Do you see any of the caterpillar damage? No, you don't. But if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 410 caterpillars on your oak tree, you know, most people out there would say, call the man, get the spray can, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Caterpillars eating trees is normal. Uh, it's normal, particularly for oaks. Uh, because oaks are willing to share some of their energy, we have other living things in our yard. I met a woman, Tammany Baumgarten. Uh, in uh, New Orleans several years ago, who says we should all practice the 10 step program, take 10 steps back from our trees and all of our insect problems will disappear. And I think that's wonderful advice. Another way to get around leaf toughness in August is to become a leaf miner. Instead of eating the tough uh, cuticle on the uh, upper and lower epidermis, you're gonna only eat the middle of the leaf, the palisade mesophyll, the parenchymal cells. But to do that, you have to get really small and really thin. So here's a, uh, this is a leaf miner. This is actually a caterpillar type of moth and the egg was laid here. It's a serpentine leaf mine because it looks like a, a snake. So it hatched here, it was very small and it crawled around eating material, not much material. The little line here is it's, it's poops, it's frass. And then it pupated here and that's all the leaf it's, it's going to eat. This is a blotched leaf miner. There's the caterpillar itself in there eating away. Here's what it looks like when it's backlit, and here's what it looks like with a very nice picture from Salvador Batenza. Uh, they don't look a lot like caterpillars um, because of the adaptations necessary to be a leaf miner, but they are caterpillars. And when they come out as an adult, they do look like, like moths. They're tiny, 
but they look like moths. This is one of the Camomeria species that specializes on oaks, the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, a lot of leaf miners on oaks in August. August is also the, the uh, most dangerous time to be a caterpillar because populations of the things that eat caterpillars have built up to very high levels. This is a eumenid wasp, a uh, potter wasp that has just uh, stung this uh, yellow striped oak worm. So it's, it's now stiff as a board, it's not dead, but uh, what it's gonna do is carry that caterpillar back to its little mud wasp and stuff it in there and then lay an egg on it. And the egg will hatch and eat this caterpillar alive. Uh, so it sounds pretty gruesome, but it's actually a very, it's nature's way of re supplying refrigeration. If they, if the wasp had killed this caterpillar, instead of just paralyzed it, um, it would rot before the egg even hatched. So uh, this way, the larva has something fresh to eat. This is an egg mass of the yellow neck caterpillar that we saw earlier, shortly after it was laid. And here, right away, a tiny little wasp, a tiny little egg parasitoid comes along and it's going to lay eggs in a lot of these eggs. And here they are hatching out um, several days later. Uh, so I didn't count the percentage that, uh, that, uh, that one wasp hit, but it was a substantial number of these eggs that were killed before the caterpillars even hatched. So these are natural enemies that keep those caterpillar populations in check. And here's another parasitoid, a uh, member of the uh, tachinid family, tachinid flies that uh, lay eggs on caterpillars as well. And there's a lot of species of tachinid, in fact, thousands of them that are keeping our caterpillars under control. This is a saddleback caterpillar. It's one of the species you don't want to pet, but um, it is dead three times over. That's a tachinid egg that hasn't hatched yet. It's going to hatch and the, the larva will tunnel into this caterpillar and kill it. This is a tachinid larva that's already in there. That's its breathing tube that it has poked out through the integument because it it's need, needs air. And here's a tiny little teramelid wasp that's laying eggs inside this saddleback caterpillar. So three, three ways it's going to die. Uh, it's very difficult to find a caterpillar that is not parasitized at the end of the season. This is a contracted Daytana, another oak specialist that has four tachinid eggs laid on it. These three haven't hatched yet, but this one has hatched and is already tunneled into the caterpillar and it will kill it. This is a black blotch caesura that has figured out how to fool the tachinid. It has three markings on its back that look a lot like tachinid eggs. So the tachinid comes along and says, oh, you're already parasitized. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna lay my eggs here because whoever's here first has a head start and they will end up killing my, my larva. So it's actually nobody inside this one. Uh, it's just a, a marking that fools the fly. Another way to escape parasitism is to jump off your leaf and hang by a silken thread. There is a silken thread there, you can't, you can't see it, but this caterpillar is hanging there and it'll hang there until the danger goes away. Then it crawls up and gets back on the leaf. Uh, the danger often comes from Braconid wasps that um, they're actually very clever. If they can't catch a caterpillar up here, there are species that will lean over and actually pull up the line hand by hand over hand uh, and then lay an egg in the caterpillar. Or they shinny down the silken thread and get the caterpillar. So uh, caterpillar life in August is, is very tough. Okay, September, our final month. That's, of course, when we, uh, we see crickets, the black crickets on the ground. You know, if a cricket gets in your house and starts to sing, it's, it's good luck. But there are crickets up on trees and bushes, too. They're called bush and tree crickets, and they're not black. They're typically yellow or greenish, uh, but they're doing the same thing that the katydids are doing. The males are singing in order to attract females, and they want to sing as loud as they can to tell the female they're the best male. Uh, but these, these males uh, actually are sending a false signal to the, to the female. They're, they're not telling her the truth. What they do is they find a hole, then they stick their head through the hole and raise their, their uh, wings and rub them back and forth and make their species-specific chirping sound. And most leaves are, have a slight parabolic shape to them, so it projects the sound farther and louder than if he sang on a flat surface. So he's sending a, a false message of his size to the female. She comes and mates with them. It's hard to believe that a male would actually deceive a female like that. But you know, maybe he's not deceiving her because he might not be the, the largest male, but he might be the smartest male. And some species actually chew a hole in the leaf to allow them to do that. August is also the most likely time you're, you're going to see walking sticks. 
There are various species around the country. This is one I, I saw on an emery oak in Arizona. They're called walking sticks because uh, they look like sticks and they walk. They're never very common. They're usually up in the, the canopy, but they're curious looking insects. Okay, we have made it through the year talking about just a few of the things that happen on the oaks uh, in your yard around the country. So I wanna end by, by um, reminding you that we have a serious biodiversity crisis on, on planet Earth. We have two crises. We've got climate change and we've got a biodiversity crisis. But what most people don't realize is that if we had no climate change, we would still have a biodiversity crisis because we have not shared the Earth with our fellow earthlings. We talk about birds disappearing. We've lost three, 3 billion birds in the last 50 years, breeding birds. We've got global insect decline. All these things are vanishing. I love the headlines. They're not vanishing, we're killing them. We're killing our birds, we're killing our insects. That's why we're in the sixth great extinction event uh, that the earth has ever experienced. So it is a crisis, it's a global crisis. The good news is it, it has a grassroots solution. That's what we're all here for today, to, to enact the solution. Grassroots, you, me, everybody has a responsibility to turning this around and we can do it. There are four things that every landscape has to accomplish. It has to be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, and locking it up in plant tissues. That's gonna help climate change. It has to manage the watershed in which it, it exists. Nobody has the right to landscape in a way that, that destroys the local watershed has to support a diverse community of pollinators, not because they pollinate our, our agriculture, or because they pollinate our crops. You hear that they pollinate a third of our crops. Um, it's really about one twelfth of our crops. And then I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need pollinators. We need pollinators everywhere because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we didn't have pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option. And every landscape has to support a complex community or food, a complex food web that supports the animals that, that run our ecosystems. When you plant an oak, you are accomplishing three of those four ecological goals. Uh, you're going to uh, plant the, the best uh, carbon capturer. You're going to manage the watershed the best. You're gonna support the most complex food web of any plant out there. The only thing you're not gonna do better than other plants is support a diverse community of pollinators because oaks are wind pollinated. Uh, even though there's increasing evidence that pollinators do use oak pollen, they just don't, they don't move it. They don't pollinate with it. So three out of four is, is pretty good. All right, despite all their, their landscape attributes, our oaks are in, in trouble these days. The old giants are gone from our forests for the most part. We cut them down to make room for agriculture or to get their, their wood. Um, in the east, the percentage of oaks in our eastern forest has been cut in half in the last century. Uh, we used fire management, well, we, the Native Americans used fire, fire management uh, for you know, thousands of years, literally, and it increased the percentage of oaks in our forests. And then the Europeans came and said, no, no more of that. Uh, and we've also introduced serious oak pests. You've got sudden oak death syndrome and some other diseases in the west. We've got gypsy moth, uh, which is now spongy moth, by the way. Uh, we've got uh, bacterial leaf scorch, we've got oak wilt. Uh, these diseases and pests are hammering our, our oak forests. And we have habitat fragment, fragmentation. Remember, oaks are wind pollinated. If we separate them by distances beyond which the pollen can reach, then the reproduction is, is terrible. And because of all those things, 28 of our 91 North American oak species are, are threatened. One third of the global oaks are endangered. The Oregon white oak, uh, you know, Quercus gariana, uh, grows from central California right up through Washington state, has lost 97% of its range because it loves to grow where we put agriculture. So down they come. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. And we can go around the world with the same types of statistics everywhere. So we humans live our lives out in a very brief instant of ecological time, and we cannot right all these wrongs in that time. We cannot put those giants back into our landscapes, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today or yesterday will become big enough to start to fulfill their keystone roles in, in our landscapes. Everybody on the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because everybody requires good earth stewardship. And the best way to exercise your responsibility for earth stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. 
So for the sake of our turkeys, our, our chickadees, our uh, woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our, our uh, nododonid caterpillars, our uh, lightning bugs, our galls, our weevils, our orthopterans, us for our own sake. Plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. All right, Doug. Well, thank you very much. I loved that you ended with what we can do ourselves to, um, to help. It seems like there's so many things that we can't do, but it's nice to know that the things that we can do. Um, and uh, we had a lot of questions, as you can imagine, in the chat. So um, I think um, if, if, if someone is watching now and they want to know, right, I'm fired up. I want to get an oak. What, what do they do? Like go to their local nursery and look for the smallest local oak they can find, check out the native plant nurseries and ask for a small one? Well, that's one thing you can do. Um, more often than not, you'll be disappointed. There are a lot of nurseries that don't carry that many oaks and they really do focus on the large ones so they can make a lot of money. I don't blame them. Um, there are some states uh, that actually have oak acorn giveaways. I don't know what's happening in the West, but I think Virginia does it and a few others, but that's a once a year thing. The problem with acorns is they germinate. So you, you can't do long-term seed storage. It's got to be a yearly, yearly event. So the supply of small oaks is, is small itself. And uh, the easiest thing, the easiest thing is go get your own acorns. That's just not that hard. Now you have to wait till the fall. Uh, but somewhere near you, oaks are dropping acorns. You get them. If it's in the white oak group, you plant them right away. I would put them in a pot uh, so it can germinate that fall, then protect them uh, all winter from rodents that'll get into your pot and dig them up, uh, and then plant it in the spring. Or if it's the red oak group, I would uh, put them in peat moss in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of moisture and put them in your refrigerator for the winter. Uh, because they don't germinate until the springtime and then you can you can plant them out. That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, but you know nurserymen that are listening out there, there there is a market for small oaks. so take advantage. All right and somebody posted that they thought the watershed nursery had small oaks. so I think it could only be helpful to just be asking your local nurseries, whether it's a native plant nursery or uh, one of the more conventional nurseries, to carry small oaks because if people began requesting it, maybe that's something that would become available over time. You know, this year in Portland, their last year in Portland, it was a mass year for, for uh, Oregon oak. I told my grandkids to collect as many acorns as they can, then plant them and sell them in the spring for $5 each. So we'll see. <laughs> We'll see, maybe you can go to Portland and buy one from my grandkids. But. Well, or people here could do the same thing. I know if you have oaks, you tend to have plenty of oaks because you get the seedlings popping up on your property. So give, offering them to the neighbors or planting them in a, a spot that looks like it could use oak could be an idea. Uh, people asked about what small oaks are available in California. So let me say that tomorrow we have a talk by Frederic Lavoie-Pierre on our own local California oaks and the uh, butterflies and moths and other creatures that depend upon them. So you could tune in for that. But uh, also there's the leather oak, the tan oak, the scrub oak. And to find oaks specific to your area, people can go onto Calscape, put in your address and your zip code and Calscape will tell you what oaks uh, grow, grow naturally in your area. Anything more to say on small oaks, Doug? No, but I'll pat Calscape on the back. I wish every state has had a, a resource that, that good. These are geo-referenced um, locations for every species of plant that occurs in California. It's just a tremendous resource. Yeah, we're I would excited. just, uh, Kathy and Doug, chime in that our local nurseries, I just checked a few East Bay Wilds and people are putting in the chat, a uh, watershed nursery, they all carry oaks. And I saw that for sure East Bay Wilds has a bunch of uh, scrub oaks, which is one of the local shorter oaks. So uh, we'll put the link to the list of local nurseries in the chat. Great, great. Uh, there were some questions about pruning oaks, uh, topping oaks, thinning oaks. Would Is it like for aesthetic or view purposes? Is that something that you would like strongly oppose or is it something that you feel like doesn't, doesn't really matter that much? Uh, 
You know, I am not an arborist and an arborist will tell you all the reasons why you need to prune your trees. I do know that, that um, it's, it's dangerous in terms of exposing them to those diseases. So for example, oak wilt, the best way to, to give your oak oak wilt is to prune it during uh, any time when the leaf material is green. Uh, so if you hadn't pruned it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be in, in danger. Um, you know, pruning it for a reason because it's hitting a wire or something, sure, that makes sense. You want to prove it when it's, when it's dormant, if you can, but um, most of the time I'd say it doesn't need it. It's just something we like to do. Okay. Um, people have asked a few questions about leaves. So what would you say that people should just leave their leaves alone or should they like rake them up and move them around their yard or compost them? What should people do with their leaves? Well, the reason people le rake leaves in the east is because they're on their lawn and they don't want them to hurt their lawn. Now, fortunately, you Californians are learning lawn not so good um, and you're having less lawn. And that's probably not a major reason to move leaves around. Uh, but if you do have lawn, you want to get them off the lawn, then you put them in your flower beds. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have been told by Californians, no, no, we can't do that. It's going to burn the house down. And I don't know what to say about that, but um, it'd be great to find some kind of a compromise where the ground is not bare. It's just very hard on the, the living organisms there. But you're, you are allowed to move them around. Yeah. You know, people that run them through a, a lawnmower to mulch them, you, of course, have just killed everything that's in the leaf litter, but you're at least returning the nutrients to, to the soil if you, if you blow it back on your, uh, on your property. So, you know, I, I get it that life is full of trade-offs and, and uh, doing trade-offs once in a while is fine. All right. So we had some questions about what to plant under oaks. And I want to say that the first garden that we're going to go and visit today is a five acre lot in the Oakland Hills that has an extensive oak woodland with a, a nearly intact native understory. So if you want to see the kinds of pl plants that naturally grow under oaks, you can join us so stay with us uh, for um, the next, the first garden. Also, you could look at the plant list for in Oakland, it's the Harper Baird Garden. You can see the plants that they have under their oaks. Um, Let's see. So, uh, Doug, I guess you would say that our uh, our motto should be something like a, a chicken in every pot and an oak on every lot. Is that right? Yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> can I quote you? You can. <laughs> and uh, Franklin Delano. Okay. So somebody asked about eucalyptus leaves and non-native plant leaves, and if they should also leave those leaves on the ground for. Oh, well, no, no, no. <laughs> That's a different story. Eucalyptus is highly flammable. Um, certainly the bark chips are, the tree itself is. I don't know how many of those oils remain in the leaves, but um, it's a different story with non-native uh, leaf material, particularly uh, eucalyptus, which they're very tough leaves uh, because they're often filled with allylochemicals that can't be used by our local detritivores. So uh, I know many Californians love the eucalyptus, but um, Ecologically, I can't, I can't think of very many good things to say about it. Me neither. Um, I have a question and that is, do you have any suggestions for getting oaks and other native trees on city approved uh, tree lists? They're the, the list that cities will provide a tree to you or they'll only let you plant in your parking strip or whatever. It would be great if instead of there being, you know, primarily or only non-native plants, they were primarily or only native plants. Can you have any ideas on that? Yeah, this is going to take some some um, convincing. What we need to do is is we can ask the point blank. What are the reasons you are not planting oaks? And when they say, well, they're too big, they're too this, they're too that, then we find oaks that aren't doing that and say, here are alternatives that that relieve you of those concerns. And then they've run out of excuses not to do it uh, because they'll often give you a, a reasons of why an oak won't live there and, and you know whatever they come up with. Many of the, you know, the, the city tree lists that are used all over the country were established a long time ago. There are nurseries that, that supply these things, they depend on it. And, and you know, the city officials are very reluctant to, to interfere with, with that, that pipeline. But um, 
we're just trying to change the inventory. We're, we want to get more trees into, into uh, our urban spaces. And there's really no reason why we can't move more towards natives. The idea that only non-natives will grow in our cities is, is just totally absurd. I, I want to chime in there with kind of a success um, note from San Leandro, because I actually recently got a street tree, a native, a, a live coast oak, uh, coast live oak, um, and the city planted it. And I talked to them and said, well, so why not more oaks? And they literally said, well, yeah, why not? And I heard you say in the presentation that oaks are also uh, sequestering a lot of carbon, have some climate advantages. And I think that's a lot on cities' minds. So in order to motivate more cities to get oaks and um, native oaks on the tree list, what can we say about the superior climate advantages? Do you have some notes on that, Doug? Well, they are the best, uh, best carbon sequesters. They, they live a long time. They're very dense. They're very heavy. That's made of carbon. Uh, but again, they're also pumping carbon into the soil. So uh, it's not just that they're massive and going to hold the carbon for, for a long, long time. That's a big part of it. But they're also pumping it into the soil. Now, other plants do that as well. But um, yes, we want to get as much carbon out of the atmosphere. We have chopped down more than half of the forests on the planet. And a third of the carbon that is up in the atmosphere right now comes from the plants that we have cut down. That carbon eventually goes right up in the air. If we, if we replaced all those forests, we'd pull a third of the carbon out. And that's why you've got the trillion tree uh, uh, you know, initiative around the globe. If you're gonna plant those trees and you choose the right species, you're addressing climate change and the biodiversity crisis at the same time. So, so plant choice matters. And, and if, if the city is planting trees, choose the right ones. Maybe if I may, just since we're talking about, you know, roots and bringing the carbon into the soil and oaks having these deep roots pushing a lot in there. I heard about the mycorrhizae um, relationship, especially with oaks. In fact, when I planted my street tree oak, I shoveled some soil over from my existing old oak because I thought I'd, you know, like inoculate a little bit. Um, what can you share about that? That's exactly right. You inoculate the soil from an existing plant that already has good mycorrhizal uh, relationships and they will, they will spread. Mycorrhizae spread a lot easier than we think. I tried to do an experiment way back in the 80s. I can't remember the question I was asking, but this was controlled in the greenhouse and some pots had mycorrhizae and other pots were supposed to have none. And a plant physiologist came along and said, well, how are you gonna keep the mycorrhizae out of the plots, pots, your controls, out of your controls? And I said, well, I'm not putting it in. He said, well, they're floating in the air. There's spores all over the place floating in the air. They're gonna get in there. And that convinced me right away that that uh, our soils are being inoculated a lot more easily than you would be led to believe. But the very fast way to do it is to transfer some, some just the humus from underneath the tree that exists of the species you're talking about, and you will move those right mycorrhizae. And, I, and about um, you know the parking strips, it seems like the toughest spot any oak would want to grow, right? Because it's really yeah. dense. It's uh, how not a very big planting space. Um, so. Yeah. Would you, you still think oak. it's an opportunity for getting more oaks out there? It depends on how much how much soil there is. You don't want to put them in situations where they are going to die because then somebody's going to say, "See, they don't they don't last." You know, we we give our trees just a few square feet of space in our cities. That's ridiculous, and that's because cement is our default landscape. It doesn't have to be. So I do want to use oaks every every place, but but do it where it makes sense. I'm wondering if some of the taller shrubs could make it to city tree lists, like so the bigger manzanitas or the bigger ceanothus. Like, is there something that makes a tree a tree, or would some of these tall shrubs, you know, fit the bill as well? I think they absolutely should be on those lists. You know, ceanothus is a very powerful plant. It's the best shrub you have in California in terms of supporting caterpillars and things. So, so why not? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, canopy tree that's throwing shade. That's great. But if you don't have the space for it, put in a shrub. So I see somebody posted that the uh, San Francisco chapter of the California Native Plant Society has an oak, uh, small oak giveaway program. Uh, yeah. So you could contact them. And if you live in San Francisco, see what they have to offer. And Stephanie and Jessica, feel free and 
leap in here and help me sort through some of these questions for the last few minutes, if you can. Um, can you respond, Doug, to um, do we need to worry about oak trees and fire danger in California or or is that really kind of a red herring because we're surrounded by eucalyptus anyway? <laughs> well, yes, your eucalyptus are a fire hazard, but I have been told by knowledgeable Californians that particularly your live oaks are excellent at intercepting flying embers. If you really do have a canopy fire that's going crazy, and those are the ones that cause the problems, uh, and you have a buffer of live uh, of oaks around your house, they're going to prevent those embers from hitting your house as opposed to encouraging it because they're just not that flammable. Uh, so, so uh, based on that, I'd say, well, get the oaks in there and they will actually protect you from fire. They're not going to encourage it. I want to say too that uh, I'll be giving a presentation, gosh, I think it's today, on uh, the best plants for sunny areas. And we planted an oak in front of our house, my husband and I, 25 years ago, and it was six inches tall. And it's now probably 30 feet tall and it's a magnificent tree in front of our house and uh, uh you know our son was a baby and now he's in college like just in that time period we have this like amazing beautiful oak in front of our house it it didn't seem to really take long how long how much did it cost oh probably five dollars i bought it from the california native plant society in a tiny little pot a one gallon pot there you go <laughs> Um, somebody asked about moving small oaks. Like, I guess people could look around their neighborhoods too, because if one has an oak, you tend to have a lot of other oaks popping up around it. So that could be a way to salvage a small oak. Any tips on salvaging an oak? You have to dig deep to get that tap root or? Yeah, you want to do it as soon as you can. So as soon as it pops up in your flower bed, uh, you're going to have better survivorship. You'd be surprised that an oak that maybe it's only uh, 12 inches tall, you say, oh, it's a baby. It might be 10 years old that has been waiting and it's in a terrible place and it's growing really slowly and it might have a very tough root system to, to transplant. Um, so if you, you know, the easiest time, and I do certainly favor this, is that first year. As soon as they pop up, that's the time to move them. Mm. And then and see, you go ahead, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, just a question about those um, uh, gals you mentioned in the um, presentation and how they're beneficial to oaks. Uh, why, why is that? The galls. Mm -hmm, galls. I don't think I said they were beneficial to the oaks. <laughs> it's one of the insects that is using oaks and the oaks, they've come, come up with a compromise and that's what the gall is. Um, and the compromise is, uh, here's a, a um, it's essentially a boring insect that's going to bore through plant tissues, but the gall confines it to one place uh, and, and the oak actually pumps food into that place and the gall is not gonna go anywhere. It's not gonna mess up the vascular system of the plant. Uh, but you know, if, the, if the oak had a choice, it probably would say, I, you know, I'd rather not have the galler. It doesn't have a choice. So this is a compromise between the galler and, and the, uh, the oak itself. Uh, there's an interesting case in, in St. Louis where uh, there's something called the horned gall and it, it really loves pin oaks. Well, St. Louis is doing a couple of things wrong. They've got massive pin oak populations. I mean, it's about the only oak they planted. So right away, the gawler has a, a monoculture of what it likes. And they also spray heavily for mosquitoes. They go down the streets and they fog for mosquitoes. And what I, and so right now they're having this, this horned gall outbreak where the trees have so many galls and it's really affecting the trees. What can we do about it? The galls are terrible. I think they've killed all of the um, parasites that control those galls with that mosquito spray. So, uh, you know, if you're using mosquito spray, I don't think you do too much of this in California, but if you do, uh, it doesn't just kill mosquitoes. It kills everything that it comes in contact with, particularly the natural enemies. Uh, so you do need those natural enemies to keep your galls in check. Your gallers in check. Oh, and I guess you would suggest if someone is planting an oak and they don't feel like they could have three of them in their property, at least they could be planting some substantial native shrubs like ceanothus or manzanita next to them to help with the support and the root intertwining. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't have to be the same species by any means. Some questions. Last questions. Go ahead. See what you can find. Yeah, just um about water and sewer lines, and you know, with that tap root, the deep root, any comments on 
if oaks are worse for say sewage lines than other street trees is that an argument against them or yeah. um, trees in your garden too yeah you know it's not really a taproot it's it seems like a taproot early on but they go laterally uh, so the big oaks uh, they, they did, uh, there was a group in Europe that were digging up the root system of a Quercus robar, the English oak, to see how far out it went. And they got three, three times the width of the canopy. And this was a mature tree. So it was, it was over 300 feet. And they gave up because the roots just kept going. So those roots go a long way. And it, they're going laterally, not down. And they do bang into things. So that, that can be an issue. Uh, if you have a, a septic system, you probably don't wanna put an oak over the septic system. Um, you know, uh, we need to look at the glass half full. How can we make oaks work instead of looking at all the reasons that they're not gonna work? We can find places for our oaks. We just have to, sometimes we have to work at it a little bit. If you've got a lot of infrastructure and sewer lines and everything, plant a small oak. They're not going to have giant root systems. And I guess one would have the same objection to planting any tree at all. So yeah. Yeah. Tree, we should be planting our own local trees and then the oaks specifically. Exactly. So I think I'll say then, Doug, thank you so much for joining us again this year. It was great to have you. It was a terrific and very motivating talk. And I hope we see a lot more oaks going in in people's gardens and in our uh, on our city street tree lists because of it. I do too. And thanks again for doing this, Kathy. You're welcome. Have a nice day, Dr. Jelmy. Orinda Books has again made the tour a great offer. You can purchase any of the following books from Orinda Books and a portion of the proceeds will be donated to the tour. You will also be supporting Orinda Books, a local small business. In this case, the small business is owned by longtime garden tour host, Pat Rudabush, whose lovely native plant garden in Orinda you may have visited in the past. You can call Orinda Books at 925-254-7606, or you can order online at orindabooks.com. And I think that Stephanie might be able to put this list of books and the contact information for Orinda Books in the chat. The benefit books are any of Doug Tallamy's books, Doug's most, whoops, advance the slide, sorry. Doug's most recent book, The Nature of Oaks, uh, the New York Times bestseller, Nature's Best Hope, or Bringing Nature Home, or any of our local California specific books, Designing California Native Plant Gardens by Alray Middlebrook and Glenn Keeter, Garden Allies by Frederic Lava Poyer, Native Plant Gardening for Birds, Bees, and Butterflies in Northern California by George Oxford Miller, or California Native Gardening, a month-by-month -month guide by Helen Popper. I'd like to thank uh, our stalwart major funders, the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, the Contra Costa Clean Water Program, the Contra Costa Water District, and the Clean Water Program Alameda County for their continued belief in this program and the funding that makes this tour possible. I'd like to thank the other sponsors for their support for this year's tour. And these sponsors as well. Garden tour hosts Ann Chambers and Ed McAlpin have generously offered a $500 challenge grant. If these funds can be matched with donations from viewers. If you haven't yet had the chance to contribute, please help by making a donation now. You can do so via the donations button on the tour's homepage at Bringing Back the Natives. You'll see it at the bottom. Through Venmo at Bringing Back the Natives, on the tour's GoFundMe page, or you can mail in a check. The tour's address is under Contact Us.